Thank you um, for the opportunity to join you this morning and share with you uh, what I expect, just based on experience, will be something very different from uh, any sort of presentation on money and government finance that you've probably been exposed to before, and I think that's a good thing. Um, I, as chair of the Department of Economics, um, had a pretty traditional training myself. I mean, my graduate training started at the University of Cambridge in 1996, really conventional stuff. So the stuff that you find in the textbooks about what money is, where money comes from, how money works in the economy, how banks create money, how the Fed controls the money supply, how interest rates go up when deficits increase because governments have to borrow from a limited pool of financial resources and when they borrow more it drives up the price of you know, uh, money and so forth. And so all that conventional wisdom was my training in economics. And um, I just think it's wrong, okay? And so I wanna walk you through some of the reasons why I think it's wrong and why it's important that we get it right. Because when we get it wrong, we can, as investors, place bets on the expectation that rising deficits are going to push up interest rates. And you positioned for that that QE was going to lead to an acceleration in the rate of inflation, the position for that. And that you know we're watching what's happening in the Eurozone and we say, okay, we should begin to position for that, whether it's you know debt protection on treasuries or something to, because of the instance of default likelihood and all these sorts of things. If you get the economics wrong, if the theory is wrong, then the consequences can be really significant for not just investors, but for people who live in the country where the policies are being guided by these wrong-headed economic theories. So I like this quote very much from Mark Twain. It says, uh, it ain't what you know that gets you into trouble, it's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And there's a whole lot of stuff that we think we know for sure that just ain't so. Okay, and why do we get these things wrong? Look, it's really easy to get confused about issues surrounding money and deficits and debt. Most people don't understand where money comes from, how it works in the economy. They think the government is just like a great big household, subject to the same sorts of rules that the rest of us have to play by. Must balance your budget, live within your means, all that sort of stuff. Most economists get this stuff wrong. The textbooks are full of irrelevant and inapplicable ideas about how money and finance work in the economy. So whether it's the quantity theory of money that tells you that in increases in the rate of growth of the money supply always lead to a proportionate increase in the price level. Okay, that's traditional conventional economic theory. It's wrong. Stuff about crowding out, government deficits increase so interest rates go up and that crowds out private sector investment. It's wrong, okay? All this stuff about how the money multiplier works and how banks make loans because they're constrained by how much reserves they have and the Fed controls it, it's wrong. And people are beginning to figure out that it's wrong and they're beginning to attempt to correct the narrative. And so just within the last couple of months, the Bank of England came out with a piece and the Bank of England said, this is how banking actually works. And it completely turns on its head the stuff that's in all the textbooks. Okay, so people are starting to figure it out. I have conversations, um, you know, I heard Larry Summers just the other day, someone sent me a clip. And Larry Summers is making the exact points that I was making to him a year and a half ago uh, when he was resisting it, but now he's standing up and saying it exactly the way I would say it. So people are putting this stuff together and they are attempting to do better in terms of explaining the way things work. But there are these sacred canons in economics and they spill over into finance. And they just don't hold up under scrutiny. And one of the most important is this idea that the best way to achieve growth and prosperity for the economy is to get government finance under control to achieve balanced budgets. So you go to a website and you find, this happens to be from GOP.gov, but I'm not picking on GOP because you find exactly the same thing on a Democratic website. Okay? Obama has said exactly the same sort of thing. But what does it say? It says, if we want to have growth and prosperity, we have to stop spending money we don't have. Stop spending money we don't have. Balance the budget. 
this is how you achieve growth in the economy. This is the path to prosperity. So we gotta get the government deficit under control. And people hear it, and it polls well, and it seems to make sense. Why? Because the finances that we're most familiar with are our own. And so when we hear someone say, you can't spend more than you make, you can't go into debt, you can't borrow and borrow and borrow and finance spending in excess of what you're taking in, you're gonna go broke. And we say, well, that makes sense. Because I've seen people who get too much debt, all of a sudden, they're filing bankruptcy. I've seen a firm unable to pay its bills filing Chapter 11. I know that can happen, and I know it's important to save for the future. So if it all makes sense for me, well, by God, it ought to make sense for the government, too. And that's what they tell us. That's what the politicians say. That's what the pundits say. That's what the narrative is. So here's another website. Right? Pick one. There are thousands like this out there. This is Money Matters 101. What does it say? It says, we're all drowning in debt. We, there's no end in sight. We have to stop the madness. We need to balance our budgets control the urge to spend, and pay off your debt. Standard, typical financial planning advice, perfectly sensible, nothing wrong with it at all, unless everyone in the economy tries to follow it at the same time, at which point it becomes catastrophic advice. Catastrophic advice. Who's that guy? That's Paul McCulley. That's cool, I'm retired now, Paul McCulley. Not Paul McCulley was at PIMCO number two under Bill Gross for a number of years. I like to refer to him as the brains at PIMCO. Uh, he left, but this is a very, very smart guy, okay, and, and a friend. And McCulley understands this perfectly well. And he says, look, if everybody reduces spending and tries to save more, it will kill the economy. This is McCulley. What, why does he say that? Why on earth? Would spending less and saving more be detrimental for the macroeconomy? And it's simple. It's because capitalism runs on sales. It's the simplest way to describe a capitalist market for profit economy. It runs on sales. And every dollar that someone saves instead of spends is a dollar that isn't captured by some business that is trying to earn revenue to become part of its profits in order to be viable. Okay? Spending creates income. We have made spending the, the enemy in the economy. But spending can't be the enemy. Spending creates income. Every single time someone spends, there's someone on the other side of that transaction who's receiving a payment for something. So less spending means less income to someone else. OK, but income leads to sales. When your income goes up, you spend more over your lifetime. Higher income earners spend more. Spending creates income, and income creates sales. People spend a portion of all the income, additions to income they receive. And sales create jobs. Businesses hire and invest when they're swamped with customers. It is that simple. But we've gotten this very wrong in our heads. And we've made spending the enemy in the economy. And it cannot be, okay? When, when people talk about the economy or economic growth, what are they talking about? What single measure do they look at? GDP, right? You look at GDP. So how's the economy doing? Or do we have a growing economy? Do we have a healthy economy? I don't know. What's our GDP doing? Well, what is GDP? It's a measure of all the spending on final goods and services produced in the economy. So GDP measures how much we're all spending. So if we all spend less, GDP goes down, right? It goes down. You don't get prosperous economic growth by telling everyone, save more, spend less. It won't happen, okay? Saying to someone, we need to cut spending to grow the economy is an oxymoron invented by regular morons. You can't do it. It won't work, okay? So we've got this all wrong. What happens in the economy is you know, the textbooks show a picture of, of a big circle where the money goes around in a circle. And so the idea is that business firms hire workers and pay them wages and salaries. And workers take their income and buy back the goods and services that the firms produce. And we all go around happily in a circle like this. 
But the real world is not quite so neat. It's messy. Capitalism is dynamic. We don't go around in a big circle like this. There are all sorts of ways that the money incomes that we earn don't go back to the firms to purchase the goods and services they produce. They leak out. How do they leak out? Well, we save some of our money. We don't spend it all. So saving is a form of leakage. It represents income that is earned that doesn't go to buy back the goods and services that our firms are producing. Saving is a leakage. Every dollar that is taxed away from us by government is a form of leakage. Every dollar taxed away is a dollar we don't have and we can't spend buying back the goods and services that our firms produce. Taxes are a leakage. And every dollar that we spend buying goods and services produced somewhere else in the world, right? We import them. That's a leakage. So those, those dollars are not going around in the circle chasing those goods and services. They're leaking out. In this graph right here, it's all the blue arrows. It's all the blue arrows, the leakages, OK? Offsetting those leakages are a bunch of other things. We can think of them as injections, spending back into the circle. OK, where do those come from? Well, one place is the rest of the world buys some stuff from us. And so we export to them. That puts money back in. That inserts spending demand. So that's an injection. What else? Government spends. Okay, there's not just taxing, but there's also spending. Spending is an injection. Government spending is an injection. The last one is investment spending by businesses. And in macroeconomics, when we say investment spending, we don't mean stocks and bonds and stuff. We mean factories and equipment, machinery. So investment spending is a leakage. So the question is, on balance, what's going on? Do you have more injections? Do you have more leakages? So the, the whole thing can be boiled down in, in simple terms to this bathtub. Okay? This bathtub is like the economy. The injections come from the faucet. Okay? The water's coming in the tub. The leakages are what's going out the drain. The water level is the health of the economy. So if you have a healthy economy, full employment, then the water level in the bathtub is right at the full employment line. If you have a weak economy, sluggish growth, anemic job market, and so forth, then the water level is way below full employment. So we are below full employment, and we have been for five years or more, right? How do you get to full employment? You either put more in the faucet or take less out the drain. It's that simple. You calibrate these flows to achieve the macroeconomic goal, which is full employment. What if you put too much water in the tub? What do you get? You get inflation. Okay, so what you're trying to do is achieve dual goals, full employment with relative price stability without getting inflation. This is the Fed's dual mandate, right? So how do you achieve that? You calibrate these flows. Right? Water in versus water out. What have we done? We get it all completely backwards. So we have two parties, for all intents and purposes, and they fight nonstop. One side says, we have a spending problem, by which they mean we're spending too much. The other side says, we don't have a spending problem. What we have is a revenue problem. And they mean we aren't collecting enough revenue. So one side wants to spend less, but spending is someone's income, and income leads to sales, and sales create jobs. So less spending just means less demand, fewer goods and services sold, and this is not what we're trying to achieve. Higher taxes, every dollar taxed away is a dollar that you can't spend. Less money income, less spending, fewer sales, fewer jobs. So we're going in completely the wrong direction. Both sides are pushing us in the wrong direction. Right? Where can the demand come from? How do we keep the recovery going? Somebody's got to spend. Somebody has to spend. It's that simple. That's what GDP is. It measures our spending. So who can do it? It's going to be either the domestic private sector, all the households and all the firms in the economy, the domestic public sector, government, or the rest of the world. It, it, it ain't going to come from anywhere else. It can't. That's all there is. Okay, so it's got to come from one or some combination of those places. So government, your, the title I was given for this talk, um, what was the title that I was given for this talk? Balan uh, Back on the ground. Back on the ground budgeting, our budgeting our economy. Budgeting our economy. How do you budget the economy? 
Well, you take advantage of the government's ability to pull the levers, to twist the, the knobs so that more water goes in or less water goes out. They adjust government spending and taxes to achieve the macroeconomic goals, not to achieve a balanced budget. The budget itself is not the goal. It's not the policy goal. It's the tool. It's the means to the end. The goal is a healthy economy, full employment, and relative price stability. Okay? So we're getting this wrong, and the parties are telling us to do the wrong thing. Cut spending, raise taxes, focus on balancing the budget. And why do we think this? Because we have all these ideas in our head that we think are true that just ain't so. And what do we think is true that just ain't so? We think the government is like a household. And this is the most important, powerful, wrong-headed myth that gets us into trouble. We think they have to behave like we do, right? We think the government can only spend more than it takes in if it's able to borrow other people's money on affordable terms. And that there's only so much money available and the more they try to borrow, the harder it's gonna get, interest rates go up. If you borrow too much, your debt level starts to go up. Now the rating agencies, just like when we have a credit rating check, they downgrade, you know, your credit score goes down. Well, the rating agencies might downgrade you, then it'll really cost you a lot to borrow, right? You'll be in real trouble. Now you're facing, you know, are you solvent? There's a fine line. Um, creditors get weary, no one wants to lend to you. Next thing you know, you're Greece. That's the narrative. Right? That is the dominant narrative. So we see a picture like this, and it scares the heck out of it, people. It's very powerful imagery. Very powerful imagery. I was driving um, somewhere from Lawrence to Kansas City not too long ago, and this was the bumper sticker on the car in front of me. That is meant to accomplish a particular goal. Right? It is meant to shake you into uh, you know, believing that this nation is in real trouble, that we can't do things. We can't do things because we've run out of money. We're broke. It's terrible. It's also wrong, right? It's also wrong. This is a quote from St. Louis Fed, okay? I use this all the time. What does the St. Louis Federal Reserve tell us? First sentence, very important. As the sole manufacturer of dollars whose debt is denominated in dollars, the U.S. government can never become insolvent, that is, unable to pay its bills. When we use the words sole manufacturer of something, what do we call it in everyday parlance? Monopolist. A monopolist. The sole manufacturer of something is the monopolist. Guess what? The United States government is the monopoly issuer of the dollar. It has a monopoly on the creation of the currency. It can't come from anywhere else. It doesn't come from China. Okay, they don't need to come get it from us in order to spend because they are the monopoly issuer of the currency. We're getting this very, very backwards in terms of money and finance and the constraints and so forth. No, we'll never be dependent on the Chinese. There will always be a market for government securities because the US government has the only means of creating a, an interest-bearing alternative, a place, a safe place to put dollars is the US Treasury. There will always be a demand for investments of that kind. So this is uh, Chairman Alan Greenspan, under oath, sitting and testifying, and he's being asked a question by Congressman Paul Ryan. In this video clip, I'll still just tell you what he says. So Congressman Ryan says, Chairman Greenspan, we all know that Social Security is going broke, right? The thing is, is uh, gonna be bankrupt, it's, it's set up badly, it's not affordable, don't you think we should begin to transition today toward a system of personal savings accounts away from Social Security as it's currently set up because we all know it's unsustainable. This is the question. Greenspan leans into the microphone and begins to school Congressman Ryan. And he says, well, I wouldn't say that Social Security is unsustainable the way it's set up today because, and I quote, there's nothing to prevent the federal government from creating all the money it wants and paying it out to someone. Whoa. 
Nobody ever says that when we have this conversation about whether we need to raise the retirement age, cut benefits, adjust to you know, cost of living adjustment to wait. Nobody ever says that it's a choice, that we can always write the checks, that there's nothing to prevent the government from doing that. Then he goes on to make what's really the important point. He said, the question is, will the real assets be there in the future that those benefits are employed to purchase? In everyday language, because Greenspan did not speak in everyday language, in everyday language, what Greenspan said is, the question is, will we be a productive enough society in the future when we make those benefit payments to seniors, the um, disabled, and their dependents, will we be a productive enough society so that when we send those checks out, we don't get inflation? Will the real assets be there in the future that those benefits are employed to purchase? It's about productivity. It's about whether we're going to have a full employment economy. Or if we send those checks out, will there be too much money chasing too few goods because we are a productive society? That's what the question should be about. That's what the debate should be about. And what could we be doing today to ensure that in the future we are a productive society, a highly productive society? So with demographic changes, fewer people working, more retired people, can we produce enough stuff to allow the people who are receiving these benefit payments to receive what they've been promised in full, on time, and not get inflation? That's the whole debate right there. That should be the whole debate, because it's all that matters. Okay, the question cannot be about affordability. Greenspan says it. There's nothing to prevent the government from making those payments on time, in full, forever, period. It is not about affordability in financial terms. It is about real resources. It's about inflation, okay? So how come people don't understand this? Well, because as Mark Twain said, sometimes it's just easier to fool people than to convince them that they have been fooled. And I'm telling you, we have been fooled, big time. We've been fooled into thinking that we're still on a fixed exchange rate system, that we're still on a gold standard that we face the same sorts of constraints that a country like Greece faces, or Argentina used to face, or Mexico in the 90s, or whatever. We think that we have all of these constraints that no longer apply, okay? And so we ask these questions about fiscal sustainability and all this sort of stuff. In the US today? In Japan today? In the UK today? No. We're getting it wrong and it's costing us trillions and trillions of dollars. Everyone has seen the debt clock tick, 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 right? It runs in real time and the numbers go up. Well, there's also this thing called the lost output clock. And it measures all of the output that we didn't produce, the income we didn't generate, because we didn't get our economy back to full employment. So before the Great Recession started, we were moving along that blue line. That was our GDP trajectory. But we got knocked off the blue line because the recession hit and real GDP went down and it went down to that red line and that was what we actually produced, the red line. What we could have been producing if we'd been at full employment, the blue line, the difference between the two, lost output, lost income, the savings, the wealth, all that went with it, gone forever, we'll never get it back, it's lost and the clock keeps ticking the longer we wait. Okay? We've been fooled, we've been fooled into thinking that we've actually run out of money, been fooled into thinking that somehow we are at the mercy of the Chinese, that they get to decide how much we can spend, that dollars somehow depend on their willingness to give them to us, even though we are the monopoly issuer of the currency and dollars can only come from the US government, that the bond vigilantes will come after us, the rating agencies, that we're gonna end up like Greece, or worse, Zimbabwe, right? All of this is nonsense. And the truth is really hiding in plain sight. The world changed in 1971. President Richard Nixon took the US off of a monetary system that was called the Bretton Woods system. It was a system of fixed exchange rates. 44 countries participated, 43 of them fixed the value of their currencies to the US dollar and threw the dollar to gold. And when you have a monetary system like that and you are pledging to convert your currency into something that's finite, gold at a fixed price, you have to run your policy very differently. You do 
have to be fiscally conservative. You do face real constraints, okay? We don't have that anymore. The policy space has opened up and we pretend as if we're still hampered by the old rules under the gold standard. And it's costing us trillions and trillions of dollars. The CBO estimates that by 2024, we will have lost an amount equivalent to $24.6 trillion as a consequence of the Great Recession. $24.6 trillion. This is a big mistake, right? And it accumulates. What I'm saying is, the simple fact is that in a country like the US, and I'll explain what I mean by that, we actually need the federal government to run deficits almost all the time, right? Almost all the time. And you hear me say that and you think, God, this woman, right? What a nut job, right? This is the most fiscally irresponsible thing I've ever heard anybody say. So I'm gonna spend the rest of the time defending that statement. Okay, obviously a deficit hawk thinks that this is fiscally irresponsible and crazy. No way. You cannot run deficits forever or nearly forever. Okay, we should have balanced budgets all the time. Never spend a dime more than you take in in taxes. Okay, that's their position. Deficit hawks. Deficit doves. Kinder, gentler deficit bird. Also, very much in favor of balancing the budget, but not at every moment in time, not every calendar year, but over the course of the business cycle. So they say things like, well, it's true that deficits are very bad, and we would like to avoid them, but golly gee willikers, sometimes the economy is just so weak that we need the government to run a little bit of a deficit, but then when the economy recovers, we promise to, to be good and we'll run surpluses then. And so we get a deficit in the weak times and a surplus in the good times, so over the course of the business cycle, the budget will be balanced. This is the deficit dove position. All right, there's gotta be a smarter bird around because these two are dodos, okay? So who, who else, what, uh, what other way is there to think about this question? So I like the idea of having a deficit owl come into play because as everyone knows, owls are wise. They can, their heads go all the way around so they could see things that other people are missing and they see in the dark. So, right, what would a deficit owl, how would a deficit owl think about the deficit? What questions would they ask? There's a uh, emerging school of thought in macroeconomics and it's sometimes referred to as uh, modern money theory or MMT. Um, this is, a uh, little graph that you see in the bottom corner here is something that I um, put out uh, via Twitter years ago, and a couple of days later it showed up in an article in the Financial Times with a story about how I think about the deficit. And the um, reporter at the FT who wrote the story said, you know, when you, it doesn't sound right at first. And she said, but if you think about it and you look at it and you focus all of a sudden it becomes clear, she said, you'll never see it the same way again. And she likened it to an auto stereogram, which I had to look up, because I did not know what that was. So what, she says it's like an auto stereogram, what the heck is that? It's one of those pictures with the wavy lines or the little dots, and it looks like nothing at first glance, but then if you sort of relax your eyes and, and look at it for a minute, it becomes clear, right? So this is what she said about that little picture. And it will change the way you perceive things. All right, so very quickly, um, this is like my, the, the disclaimer in my talk where I say, <laughs> pay close attention because I'm, when I leave here, I don't want the whisper campaign to start where somebody says, I cannot believe she said deficits don't matter. I didn't say that. I won't say that. I'll tell you that deficits matter in a way that most people don't realize. I can't believe she said the government should just keep spending money until we get to full employment. I didn't say that. I said unemployment is evidence of a deficit that is too small. I can't believe she said we can print our way to prosperity. I didn't say that. I said we could have a much more prosperous economy. I can't believe she said there are no constraints on government spending, no limits. I didn't say that. I said the limits that are relevant are inflation. They're on the real side of the economy, not the revenue or financial side. Okay, so with that, in mind, let me tell you how I think about the deficit and how I think, I wish other people would think about the deficit. Okay, we start off 
with this idea that deficit reduction is necessarily a good thing. Okay, the goal should be to reduce the government's deficit and if possible balance the budget because that is a sure sign of fiscal responsibility. Okay, I don't think of it that way. Simpson Bowles said we are going to help with this, we are going to put together a plan, we'll bring down the size of the deficit by 4.1 trillion dollars over the next 10 years. And the president said okay if that's the best you can do, I mean I was hoping for a bigger number but okay you know let's try to do that. Everybody was for it. Everybody was for it. Now this is from the CBO, this is from the Congressional Budget Office. And this graph was put out by the CBO right before the fiscal cliff drama started. You remember the fiscal cliff drama. Fiscal cliff was, at the end of 2012, if the government didn't come up with some sort of a plan to put in place, then the fit, we were gonna go over the cliff. And if we went over the cliff, all sorts of bad stuff was gonna happen. Spending was gonna go way down, taxes were gonna go up, and the deficit was going to contract sharply, fast. And the CBO said, hang on guys, <laughs> because the economy is still weak, right? We're, we're in a recovery, but it's not a robust recovery. And if you do this, there's a good chance that you will send us back into recession. So we'll have a double dip. So the CBO said, you know, don't, don't get carried away because what we're talking about here is where that darker blue starts, follow that dark blue line. And the CBO said, this is how much the deficit will fall. Look how quickly the deficit shrinks as a percent of GDP. So it'll go from like 9% of GDP all the way down to 3% or so in like two and a half, three years time. It's too much too soon. And, and it, it could send us back into recession. So they came up with this alternative scenario, that sort of uh, salmon colored line said if we could still reduce the deficit but let's go at it more slowly so we don't risk threatening the economic recovery we could have this Simpson Bowles was more like that green line I superimposed right they wanted 4.1 trillion dollars of deficit reduction in 10 years time culminating in a deficit that was only about 1% of GDP Center on budget and policy priority the yellow line just said why don't you just keep it at two and a half percent all the time Okay, so there are at least four different plans right in front of you and you're looking at this and going, I don't know, do I want the blue line? Maybe I want the green line, maybe yellow, I don't, brown is nice, door number five, I don't know what, I don't know what to support here. Okay, which one of these deficit reduction plans is the right plan? Think like a deficit owl. Don't fall for this. What would an owl do? An owl would put the deficit in context. The deficit has to be more than simply the difference between what the government spends and what it collects. It's a number, it's got a minus sign in front of it. It might be a good number, it might be a bad number, but all I know is right now it's just a number on a ledger. I don't know which number is right. The deficit owl puts the deficit in context in the whole economy with all the sectors in the economy, not just government, but how government sector interacts with the other sectors in the economy. So this little graph that I use everywhere I go that appeared in the Financial Times is the exact same graph that Jan Hatzius, chief economist at Goldman, has referred to as the most important graph in the world. That's what he called it. So why is it, now that I have your attention, Hatzius, Goldman, most important graph, why is it the most important graph in the world? What does it tell us? It tells you how three pieces of the economy fit together. The domestic private sector, the blue, all the households and all the firms in the US economy. That's your, let's say this set of chairs is the household sector and you're the business sector and together you make up the private sector in the US economy, domestic private sector and you show up there in blue. This set of chairs over here is the foreign sector. It's everything else in the world, outside the US, foreign sector. And I'll play the role of government sector, okay? They're green, I'm red, you're blue. And one of the most striking features of that graph is that it's a perfect mirror image. There's a reason it's a perfect mirror image because it's, it's all derived from an accounting identity. This is actual historical data from the US, I didn't make it up, it exactly 
nets to zero, which means if you collapse the top half onto the bottom, you're at, you're at the zero line. You got nothing. What the graph shows is that if you are above zero, if you're above zero, you're in surplus. If you're below zero, you're in deficit. Above zero, taking in more than you're spending. Below zero, spending more than you're taking in. So let's talk about what the implications of this are. If you go back to the 1950s and 1960s and into the 70s, you notice that the green, the rest of the world, was in deficit, which means these folks were buying more goods and services produced by you than you were buying from them. So they're going like this, right? Paying you for goods and services that you're producing, and they're not buying as many goods and services, uh, you're not buying as many goods and services from them. So they have a trade deficit. You have the trade surplus. At the same time, me, government, the red, I'm running a deficit, which means I'm going like this more than I'm going like this. Okay, if I spend 100 and I only tax 90, where did the 10 go? It went into the non-government somewhere. So my deficit shows up as your surplus. Their deficit shows up as your surplus. You add my deficit and their deficit and you get your surplus to the penny, to the penny. Over time, what happens? The rest of the world rebuilds after the war. They're back on their feet. They're not importing so much anymore. Now their strategy is export-led growth. So they start producing more stuff and selling it to you than you're producing and selling to them. So they have a trade surplus. Now, if they have a trade surplus and I balance my budget, where are you folks going to land? You're their surplus will equal your deficit to the penny. The only way that you survive in a world in which they are running a trade surplus is if I come in and more than offset it. I can come in and deficit spend an amount bigger than their trade surplus and raise you all up. And that's exactly what almost always happens. Look where the green is above zero. Where the green is above zero, if the blue is also above zero, I'm doing my job, okay? I'm doing my job. What happened in the Clinton years is that, you know, they fell down on the job. And we think they did a great job because they balanced the budget and ran surpluses. And so people say, well, the last time we had a balanced budget and a surplus in the US was in the late 90s and 2000s. It's true, we did. But think about what a surplus is. It means government goes like this more than it goes like this. And so my surplus, together with their surplus, left you folks in record deficit territory. Never before seen unprecedented and worse, unsustainable. Because when the blue goes below zero, it happens through leverage. You're all spending more than your income. And you're doing it with debt. You're financing your purchases with debt. And so, yes, the government's budget was in surplus, but it wasn't a sign of fiscal responsibility. It allowed the private sector to leverage up and create this unsustainable debt load that ended ultimately, after a long period, in the Great Recession, right? So that is how to think about the deficit in context. You have to think about the way the pieces fit together, and we don't do that, and that's a problem. So go back to this graph from the CBO. CBO gave basically two choices. Follow the blue line, that's like the, the Band-Aid, right off, right? Get that deficit down, I don't care if it hurts, it'll only hurt for a minute, right? Rip it right off, go for it. Or the brown line, well, you know, peel it back slowly. <laughs> and bring the deficit down slowly over time. It won't hurt as bad. Uh, but, but think about what the question is really asking. How do you want to reduce the deficit? Let me say the question differently. I'll say it differently, but it's exactly the same question. Watch this. How would you like to reduce the deficit? Would you like to follow the blue line, or would you like to follow the brown line? Now watch this. How would you like to reduce the non-government's surplus? Would you like to follow the blue line or the brown line? It's exactly the same question asked two different ways, 
One, I ask you, how would you like to reduce the government deficit? The other, how would you like to reduce the non-government surplus? It is the identical question posed two different ways. And I'll bet you, if I hadn't explained it all, I'd ask you the first question, and you'd all support it. And I'd ask you the second question, you'd say, that's the dumbest thing. Don't reduce my surplus. You can't do one without the other. It's the same thing, OK? It's an accounting fact. The government's deficit is equal to the non-government's surplus to the penny every time, everywhere in the world. It is the truth, OK? Their deficit is our surplus. Their red ink is our black ink. So here we are today watching the government's deficit fall at the fastest rate since the end of World War II. It is falling like a rock. And people see it falling like a rock and say, this is fantastic. Boy, are we getting this problem under control. Okay, the latest figures, the CBO estimates, for 2012, the government's deficit will be only 2.8% of GDP. Only 2.8% of GDP. How big does it need to be? Look, if we were budgeting for a balanced economy instead of budgeting for a balanced budget, we would target the goals of full employment and price stability. But we don't do that. And so we're focused on reducing the size of the deficit. How big does it need to be? It better be at least as big as their trade deficit. Because if it's not, you're all going back below zero. No way around it. OK, who understands this? Does anybody get this? Hatzius does. McCulley does. Okay, Fidelity does. Fidelity put out this little piece, and notice the title. It's rather alarmist, right? When you put out a piece and call it Threat to Corporate Profits, that does raise some uh, attention, right? In the, what in the world is a threat to corporate profits? This was published leading up to the fiscal cliff. And so Fidelity recognized that if, the fisc if we go over the cliff and we get that huge deficit reduction the CBO has warned about, it is going to kill corporate profits. Wait a minute, I thought corporations wanted certainty and deficit reduction. I mean, these deficits were what was holding them back from investing and hiring. Why are they scared? They're scared because they understand where profits come from. They understand that government revenue, uh, sorry, deficits, look, look there, it says government deficit and there's a plus sign. It means the government deficit is an addition to, a source of, and go straight up, corporate profits. Whereas personal saving, look at the line above, personal saving minus sign is a subtraction from corporate profits. Why? Because every dollar you save and don't spend is a dollar that isn't captured by someone business selling something, can become part of the revenue, can add to profits. So saving is a threat to corporate profits. Government deficits are a source of corporate profits. That huge deficit reduction that, was, that we were facing with the fiscal cliff was viewed by Fidelity correctly as a major threat to corporate profits. So you know this is all part of the same report. Fidelity says, after the financial crisis, when the private sector reduced their spending, they actually say stopped spending, uh, the government deficits helped lift corporate profits. Those are their words. Lifted corporate profits. In fact, they say they fostered a quick recovery in corporate profits. This is all fidelity. So why are we missing this? What are we missing? We're missing that picture. This picture takes away the green. So the rest of the world isn't in this picture. This is just me and you. This is just the two of us here. So I'm the red and you're the blue. And when my deficit gets big, you see that line, that red line, big government deficit. But what happened in the top half? Blue line shot way up, big private sector surplus. What happens when the deficit begins to fall? The red line begins to go up. Deficit's falling, but the blue line starts to go down. That's your surplus, private sector. Surplus is falling. This is the way it has to work. OK, so you say, well, you need to run deficits as long as these guys are running surpluses. So where's the money come from? This is Ben Bernanke in an interview with Scott Pelley on 60 Minutes. It doesn't get more candid than this folks. When Scott Pelley says to Bernanke, hey, is that taxpayer money you're spending? You know, all this spending to stimulate the economy and all this stuff after the crash. And Bernanke says, 
no, it's not taxpayer money. He said, we, we just have a computer, and then we use the computer to mark up the size of someone's account. That's the way it works in the modern era. We have modern money. Okay, we do not, when we want to spend something, we don't go dig a hole and look for a shiny yellow rock to do it. We, that's not the way it works. Modern money, 1971 forward, no more gold standard. It's as easy as using the computer to mark up the size of someone's account when you spend, using the computer to mark down the size of someone's account when you collect taxes. So there are additions and subtractions, all created digitally on a spreadsheet. Okay, but we think the federal government is like us, like a household. Has to play by the same rules that we do. Somehow that the US dollar comes from China. These things aren't true. Okay, the US dollar comes from the US government. It cannot come from anywhere else. We're not revenue constrained. Greenspan said it to Paul Ryan. Bernanke said it to Scott Pelley. It doesn't work like that, okay? If the real resources are available in the economy, the financial resources can always be made available in the modern era. There is no economic justification right now for either spending cuts or tax increases. No economic justification. So I do this a lot. I go around, I give these talks, and someone on Twitter sends me this and says, you know, you describe in a very neat way how this all works. The problem is they'll figure it out. So they'll figure it out, right? He's scared that what? He's scared that if the government recognized that it's the issuer of the currency and took advantage of its power over the currency, that it would lead to excesses that we would end up with hyperinflation, that somehow China wouldn't stand for it, that the bond vigilantes would come in and shut us down, refuse to buy our bonds, then we end up like Greece and you know we're just afraid, we're just afraid. So let me talk quickly about these different fears. Um, hyperinflation, are we facing hyperinflation? What causes hyperinflation? There was a study done last year or the year before by two or three uh, economists, I think two, out of the Cato Institute. And one of them is Steve Hankey, he's a big name. Cato Institute, right, libertarian think tank, does a study. They say, we spent three years doing this research, and we looked for every single example anywhere in the world that hyperinflation has ever occurred. And then we studied it, what caused it. And that was what this research paper was. And what they, what they did, this uh, research is summarized by uh, Phillips, uh, Phil, Felix Salmon in, the, in Reuters. And Felix says, you know what's interesting about the research is not what, what they found, but what they didn't find. And what they didn't find in all 56 instances where hyperinflation has occurred anywhere in the world in the history of the universe, they never found it once occurring in a fully employed economy with a stable government, ever. It occurs in places where you have political upheaval, war, a coup, you have shocks on the supply side of the economy like what's happened in uh, Zimbabwe where you know, the land was taken from white farmers and redistributed to blacks with little farming experience and all of a sudden you don't have the food and the food supply is scarce and you get inflation, hyperinflation. Okay, Weimar Germany, similar story, war torn, paying war reparations in gold, the Belgians and the French come in, occupy a bunch of the productive capacity, and all of a sudden, you're trying to print Deutschmarks to buy gold, but you can't produce the stuff because the French and Belgian have come in, and so you get hyperinflation. But not in any democracy with a stable government trying to just run a full employment policy. Never has happened, okay? What does drive inflation? Well, this is a pretty nice graph. These are inflation rates globally on the top half and commodity price index on the bottom. They just move together. In particular, it's oil, overriding contributor. Right? Oil is super important. So these are supply side drivers, not demand pull, as economists say, just a full employment economy. There's almost always something else going on. Okay? What about China? We're afraid of China. Well, why does China have all those dollars? Well, because they produce a lot of stuff and send it to us to consume. And so they get dollars, and the dollars sit in their checking account at the Fed. And China says, well, I don't want them in my checking account, put them in my securities account, which is like a savings account at the Fed. 
It's called US Treasuries. So we debit their checking account, we credit their savings account. And that's China buying US securities. And when the bonds mature, and it's time to pay off the debt, which we do all day, every day, all day long, we pay and reissue, when it's time to pay off the debt, we debit the securities account and credit the checking account. How hard is that? That's what it means to pay off the debt. And then it's back in their checking account. And they say, I don't want it. Put it back in my savings accounts. So they buy treasuries. And we just debit and credit and debit and credit. Meanwhile, the real goods and services are flowing in our direction. And we think they're winning and we're losing. It's madness, right? It's madness. The bond vigilantes. We're afraid that someday there will be, the bond market will go on strike. And the US government will try to raise dollars, because right, raise revenue, and offer bonds. And the bond market will say, that's it. We're not buying anymore. We're, we're cutting you off, right? So I asked my friend Frank Newman, who was the Deputy Secretary of the US Treasury wrote a couple of books, and we talked about this. I said, what do you say to people who have this fear of you know, a strike in, by the bond market? And this is what he emailed me, along with a much longer narrative. And he said I could share it, so I use this all the time. He said the Treasury can always raise money by issuing securities. The bond vigilantes really have it backwards. There's always more demand for Treasuries than can be allocated from a limited supply of new issues in each auction. There's always more demand than supply. We will never face a strike by bond markets. And he said, the winners get the treasuries. The losers have to keep their money in a bank and face bank risk and lower earning assets. So don't worry about it, is what former De Deputy Secretary of the Treasury is saying. But obviously, there was a strike of sorts in the Eurozone. They wouldn't lend to Greece. So how come? If, if it can happen to them, why can't it happen to us? And the answer is, they jacked up their monetary system. That's a technical economic term. They messed everything up when they abandoned their own currency. When they gave up the drachma for the euro, they turned themselves from being the issuer of the currency into being merely a user of the currency. And now Greece is like the state of Georgia. And Portugal is like Pennsylvania. And Italy is like Idaho. I can go on for a while, right? You get the picture. They all gave up the currencies that they issued. And now they're borrowing in a foreign currency. And they do face constraints, which is why the Financial Times ran this piece and said, is the euro kind of a modern day gold standard? Yes, it is. You're constrained in a way similar to the constraints that would be faced under a fixed exchange rate system like a gold standard. So look, if you look at the debt in Spain and in Italy, go back to 1995. Spain's debt to GDP ratio was around 62% and Italy's was around 120%, 95. Fast forward, 2010. Spain's debt to GDP ratio is about 62%, Italy's is 120%. How many remember the debt crisis of 1995? Hands up. There are no hands up. Nobody puts a hand up. There was not a debt crisis in 1995. Why? Because all the debt was denominated in the currency that they issued. It was lira denominated. Italy always could pay, service its debt in lira because it was the monopoly issuer of the lira, right? Same exact debt level today that they had then. Debt crisis today, no debt crisis then. What was different? Their relationship to the currency, which is why we aren't like them. We did not make the colossally stupid mistake to divorce our fiscal and monetary policy and abandon our currency. They did. And they're paying a very heavy price. So what should we be doing? Um, very embarrassed to have someone from the Fed here. Um, but you know, I, I say we have to stop waiting for the Fed to fix the economy. This belief that, man, they got this toolkit. And boy, if the, if the rifle won't do it, the shotgun will. And if that won't work, the Uzi will. And then I got a cannon in the back. And, I got, I got all this firepower I can muster. No, they don't. They don't. They got nothing. They got an interest rate. In normal times, they have one policy tool, the overnight interest rate. That's it. That's it. In times of crisis, they try to whip out all this extremely new, fancy stuff, like QE and Operation Twist and forward guidance and all this. It, they're not going to get us where we need to be. You know, we need to stop waiting for the Fed to 
achieve the dual mandate. It's the right goal, but it's the wrong institution. We gotta have the fiscal, okay? We gotta have the fiscal. We're moving in the wrong direction. The sequester, the fiscal cliff, they reduce income. And by reducing income, it reduces sales. By reducing sales, you take away the incentive for firms to hire, okay? So we're adding drag to the economy. We're forgetting that by getting back on full employment, that's the path to increasing income, savings, wealth, and so forth. We're nowhere near full employment. I know what the headline numbers say, but I don't care about the headline numbers. I care about real people who want to work and contribute. They want full-time work in this economy and they can't find it. How many are there? Not just the officially you know, narrow measure of unemployed, but all the part-timers who are working part-time for economic reasons, which means the boss that took their hours away. And now they're part-time, but they really want full-time work. I'm talking about all the discouraged workers who would take a full-time job tomorrow if it were available, but it's not, so they got discouraged and they dropped out of the labor market and they're not looking. You add those two categories to the official numbers, 24 million Americans want full-time work in this country today and can't find it. How many job openings are there? Four million. You do the math. We're nowhere close to full employment, patting ourselves on the back and declaring victory. Nowhere close. We got all kinds of useful work for people to do. Infrastructure used to be one of those things that got broad bipartisan support. Didn't matter what party you were in. Everybody understood that infrastructure is important, investing in maintaining our nation's infrastructure. We did it, and now we don't do it anymore because we can't answer the big question, how are you gonna pay for it? We're gonna get those dollars, right? So we got all these people who are unemployed. Lots of them have skills in construction and manufacturing because those are the jobs they lost. We have useful projects for people to do. We have a D plus is the grade for our national infrastructure. The American Civil Engineer Society says we need to spend $3.6 trillion to get our infrastructure up to passing grade. It's disgraceful in the United States of America. People who want to work, useful projects, lots of spare capacity. This is a capacity utilization rate. How intensively our firms are using the existing plant and equipment that they have. We used to operate around 90%. Now we're down around 75%. So we got all this slack in the economy. But we can't do things, we can't fix things, we can't make things, we can't build things because we think we're out of money, right? There's no long run inflation problem. If there were an inflation constraint, the resources weren't available. I mean, we'd like to fix the infrastructure, but we don't have the concrete. We don't have the steel. We don't have the labor. We don't have, right? We don't have the machinery and the people and the raw materials to do it. Then fine, that's your constraint. You can't do it. But that's not the reality. We have the real resources, okay? Obama at one point says, listen, Corporations are awash in cash, and what they're missing are the customers to induce them to hire and invest. Perfect. Bingo. Right answer. Then he turns around and tells Scott Pelley in an interview when Scott Pelley said, at what point do we run out of money, Mr. President? And Obama unfortunately answered, well, Scott, we're out of money now. We're out of money. So yes, we can became, no, we can't, before we even started. That interview was in 2009. Okay, you can't do anything if you're broke. What are you going to do? You're done. Okay, so the obsession with balancing the budget and reducing the deficit is doing real harm in the economy. It's hurting real people. It's reducing output. It's reducing income. It costs us wealth and savings and so forth. And we haven't learned the lessons of the past. We have had in our nation's history seven periods in which we balanced the budget, ran surpluses, and started to pay down debt. People call that fiscal responsibility. We had seven periods in our nation's history where we did it. Six of them ended in depression, not recession, depression. The seventh, the most recent, gave us the Great Recession. So uh, final thought, right, is that we should focus more on balancing the economy, calibrating the flows, achieving important goals like full employment, low inflation, and care much less about the number on some spreadsheet that we label the deficit. Yeah. All right.